Today is Wednesday, July 24, 2013. This is the start of an interview of Mr. Thomas McKay at the Clinton McComb Public Library, 40900 Romeo Plank Road, Clinton Township, Michigan, in partnership with RSVP of McComb. Mr. McKay is 83 years old. He was born August the 3rd, 1929. Mr. McKay currently resides at 9084 North Roland Road, Lake Michigan. My name is Dave Brousseau, and I will be the interviewer, and Gary Miglio will be the videographer. Mr. McKay, would you state for the record the branch of service you served in? United States Air Force. Now, when you enlisted, it was called the Army Air Force. That's correct. Shortly thereafter, they divided the Air Force from the Army. Yes. In 1947? Seven. Seven. As, uh, when, when it was divided. done, I think. Yeah. Either that or early 1948, but I think it was 47. Okay. Were your folks from the United States or were they from? From the United States. They were from born yes. and raised in the yes. You were born in Drew, Mississippi. Right. That's correct. Or Mississippi. Mississippi. Oh, it's Mrs.? Yeah. Mississippi. Okay. And I assume you were the oldest. Yes. What was the crop that your family grew? We grew mostly cotton. We, we also uh, grew hay and corn and soybeans, uh, but most of our, our cash crop came from the cotton. What made you enlist in the 11th grade? Well, I saw a movie with Jimmy Doolittle flying a B-25 off of a carrier, and I said, that's for me. That's what I wanted to do. And so I began to think on it, and began to talk to my dad about me going to the, to the Air Force, and to my dad and my mother. And of course they didn't, they said, you aren't old enough to go. Well, I really wasn't, I was only 16. And, uh, but I wanted to go anyway. I didn't like very much. This was in this was in uh, June that that I actually got got my dad to go and sign the papers. They had to sign papers for you before you could get in. Oh, uh, he wouldn't sign them at first. At first, he refused to do it. And then he said, "Well, he said you're not going to be happy unless I do." So, so he went he went with me and signed the papers and. And I went uh, that next week and uh, went to Keysfield, Mississippi for Did induction. Did your dad spend any time in the service? No. My dad was, uh, what do they call him? Uh, it, it, anyhow, when, when the war started, he was a farmer, and farmers didn't have to, didn't have to, uh, well, they had to register, but they didn't have to, didn't have to serve. Was, was that the Class E? Class E uh, allotment that you went under? Yeah, we had, uh, they had a Class E allotment that they gave to the, to the uh, families, like uh, if a man had to go into the military, they uh, issued a Class E allotment, I think it was E, that they gave to his wife and his children 
you know. I don't yeah, plus that about. you had several, well, there were you and Jim here. And Bob. And, and Bob. And Glenn. Glenn was. So you had a full family that would have probably given you a deferment anyhow, your dad. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I guess that was part of the reason he got to the deferment. Uh, his brother and his brother-in-law, and uh, I had cousins and all that went in, you know, went into the military. But uh, but uh, my dad didn't have to. No, he uh, just only his youngest brother, and I think he volunteered uh, for service. Was there ever a thought to go back and get your high school diploma? Yes, there was. Uh, but I knew I I uh, was discharged in March of 1947 after eight months of service, and uh, uh, I don't know I don't know why I did that even why I asked for a discharge. But I had it, uh, I thought I had it pretty good where it was. But I did, and one of, the, one of my friends uh, from, uh, mm, I think he was from Meridian. No, not Meridian. Oh, uh, but down in, in central Mississippi, and, and that I had met, and he's, he's the one that talked me into signing up for discharge and in a few weeks in a few weeks they issued the papers and we were gone all right let's go quick. back a minute now you you enlisted and that would have been 1946 right yes yeah june june 1946 i believe i was my uh, enlistment date was the 26th day of june and then how long was it for eight months i stayed Your eight for, months I only stayed eight months, but it was for for a three-year term. When yeah. It was. And I, but I, Why did you get out? Well, uh, I don't really know. I'm, I'm sure it had something to do with the fact that World War II was over. You were in peacetime. They, that, I mean, I never heard of someone going in for a three-year enlistment, and at the end of the eight months, they just decide they're going to get out. Yeah. Get out. No. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. I'm sure I really that don't had know. something to do with it. I was in school at that time uh, in Laurie Field. And was oh, that the mechanic school? Yes, that okay. was. Okay, let's go back to that. Okay. I had asked you earlier, um, when you went in, what got you ready for your career in the Air Force as a mechanic? And you told me you were sent to a mechanic school. Yes. Actually, it was a clerical school that that got switched. Yes. <laughs> they had they, because you couldn't type. Right. I couldn't. <laughs> but type. you took typing in high school. Yes. <laughs> well, what? Oh, uh, the little the little story about that is when when I went to Panama. Uh, in 1947, see, I had gone back in uh, in the Air Force and re-enlisted in the Air Force uh, in June of 1947. Okay, that I would have been the eight months ended from when you yeah. first enlisted. Right, okay. yeah. Uh, would have been one year. It would have been a year, uh, just about within a few days of a year. Not because I think, I think my first enlistment was the 26th, and then I went in on the 3rd, I believe. It was the 3rd of June uh, when, I, when I went back. And, uh, and, the, and, uh, and, and they were gonna, they were gonna send me, they put me in the, put me in, uh, the motor pool that keeps the field Mississippi. And, uh, and I worked, worked at that for a while, and, uh, then, then they sent me. I, I just decided I wanted to go to to Alaska, and so I signed up for a volunteer uh, trip to Alaska duty in, in Alaska. And uh, when when we arrived in 
in, uh, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, they assigned us to the Army because it was Army Air Force, and uh, that was an it was an Army engineering outfit that the uh, eight thirteen the eighth eight thirteenth uh, uh, Army Air Force is what it uh, what it was called, but but it really was run by the Army, and uh, when and then Christmas time came, and I went home for Christmas uh, to visit my family. And when I got back, they said, if you go into Alaska with us, you got to go. Uh, these are my friends. Uh, said, you're going to have to join the Army. You're going to have to sign over and give up your Air Force uh, classification and be, a, be a, a soldier, an Army soldier. And but, you were going to lose? And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. But you were going to lose a strike? Not there, no, no, not at that. That was that was when the Korean War started. Okay. Uh, so uh, I told him no, I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to sign up for the Just army. Hell bent to be in the Air Force. Eh? I got yeah, I stayed in the Air Force, and they shipped me all okay. over. They shipped me to New Jersey. Was going going to ship me. I thought I might get to go to Europe, but they didn't. They kept us around for a while. Shipped me down to. New Orleans, and we stayed there about a month. Uh, and, uh, and then our ship got got grounded in the Mississippi River when we were supposed to to go to uh, wherever they were going to send us. And uh, so, uh, so after after uh, after a while, they sent me to Mobile. Uh, yeah, to Mobile, Alabama, and flew me to Panama. About a month later, they flew me to Panama, and that's when I when I uh, got in the 805th Aviation Engineer, and I'm sitting at that's when I was sitting there talking to this to the commander of that uh, that engineering outfit. It was was Major White, and he said uh, he wanted me to go to battalion headquarters as a clerk, and I said I can't do it. I can't type. And he said, well, you had typing in high school. I said, yes, but Major, do you know how many, how many points you got to have to get, a, to get a half a degree in typing? Half a credit. Half a credit in, in, in typing. And uh, he said, no. I said, you got to get over 32, and I never made it. I only got 31 and three quarter after taking the test three or four times. <laughs> and I couldn't do it. So I said, I'm not a typist. So he said, well, we need mechanics, so they sent me to the motor pool. Okay, now where, where did you go to school for the mechanics? This time I went, I went to Randolph, Randolph Field in Panama on the, uh, on the Atlantic side. Uh, they, had, they had three bases there that I know of. They had uh, Randolph Field, they had, the uh, Navy had a, a uh, outfits there, and we had the Air Force had France Field, and they were all all active, and and uh, and so they sent me there to that school, and I, I the reason they wanted me to go, I had I had would have finished it at Laurie Field, but uh, I got discharged a week before I was to graduate, and so they wanted me to have a diploma on it, a degree on it. So they said uh, they wanted me to go back to school. So I went back to school, stayed over there till I got till I finished that, and then I went back to I went back to the army again, and, and there I stayed there. Oh, I I was about eighteen months in in that army as a mechanic. Me. As a mechanic, yeah. And what kind of stuff did you work on? All all uh, gasoline engine vehicles, and then and then they decided they wanted uh, wanted some diesel mechanics in our outfit, and so they they called a bunch of us in, truck drivers and everybody else, and brought us in together, and uh, we held kangaroo court for about four weeks. That's all we got. We didn't get any teaching in 
uh, on diesel work at all, hardly. There's very little. And uh, uh, the ones that were mechanics, the few that were, there was only two or three of us. Mechanics, the rest of the guys were, were other, other things that they did. So, um, one in particular I remember was a, was a boy from Boston, Massachusetts, and, and, uh, and he, uh, he was a truck driver, and that's where he should have stayed, because he wasn't a mechanic. <laughs> And so, so uh, that's where I started with diesel work, and, uh, and I, then from the rest of uh, rest of my career in the Air Force, I I was uh, I wound up in, in being a boat mechanic. Okay, you talked to me about your twin V twelve cylinder Packards. What were they for? Uh, they were the they were the engines that that ran the that uh, that, that we that was in the 85 foot crash boat that that I finally wound up on. Um, that's a long long story, <laughs> how I got into that outfit. Um, the captain the captain that uh, now this is the captain that court martialed you. Yeah, it's the okay. one, yeah. Tell us about that. This is the one that wanted to court martial me. Uh, and I, I never did know why why he had that attitude about me. Uh, because when I first went in, I told you the, that we, we talked to the, to the commander of the, of the 805th uh, Aviation Engineers. And, and then they, they made that army. The, the, the army took it over and what, what was an army outfit and uh, they began to send uh, soldiers in uh, and to replace them. They had a headquarters company with mostly Air Force men. They had 13, 13 Air Force men in A company that I went to and then from A and B uh, and, and C company uh, mostly were army. In, uh, man, <clears throat> well, somehow. No, you you had worked on this captain. I was just about to say. Packard car. Yes, I was. This about is to where say. it all started. Yep, yep, that's where that's where this 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 outfit of him wanting the court martial me, I think, started from. But I only thought this, I, and I didn't even think of this until I had been out and been been a civilian and had had been working here in Pontiac for two or three years before I actually thought of, I think that, which is probably the true facts about that deal. Uh, he, he asked me to, to uh, tune up his, his Packard and I told him I would, so he gave me the parts and, uh, and I tuned it up for him and everything went great for months and months and months and then, uh, then, he, then he told me, it, uh, he was going to bust me. It, I some little something, and I went in and was talking to him about it, and uh, he was talking to me about it <laughs> mostly. And I told him that uh, that, uh, that that when I thought I thought that he had gotten this information from one of the guys he court-martialed, and I think uh, what happened, he asked. Uh, uh, Joe Edcock, if he, uh, if, if where he got the, where the captain got those, the parts for the, his vehicle, he, and my opinion is that he probably told him that, that he got them from supply, uh, from the army supply, uh, stuff, you know, and, and I, and I used them well. The CIA came down and they, they questioned us about that and. I told him no, no, that uh, uh, Captain Jones didn't do that. He did. I don't think he did it. I said I think he bought. I think he bought those parts downtown in Panama City, and brought them for me to put on, which I did. And but uh, evidently, when they, when they probably told him that uh, that they had been told that he had had gotten them from. From military spy, and that was the issue. 
the yeah, that parts was the for issue. his personal yeah. car yeah. from military supply. Right. <coughs> versus getting the parts, paying for it personally. Yes. Yes. That's 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 that was the thing, and I think that's what caused our problem because I never, I I, I didn't have have any other problems with uh, with the work or anything else, you know. Uh, I just didn't have it, and uh, but uh, so so he uh, he told me that one time we were in. He had he had a couple more guys in, and they, they called me in as a witness. That's what it was, and he he told me he goes over all this stuff again uh, uh, with me, and uh, he told me he said I'm going to bust you. It's the last thing I ever do, <laughs> and I said well. Captain, you've got the privilege. Any time you that you so choose to bust me, I said you got the you got the privilege to do it. And I said, but make sure you got the goods on me when you do, because I said it's going to be it's going to be a fight if you do. And so uh, we let it go like that. And he finally did. He finally put me in for the escort marshal, and that was. <clears throat> of course, he had to go to the army. Uh, to get it, and he had to go through the army, but to get it approved, he had to go through the Air Force also. So they sent they sent uh, my request for or uh, his request for the general court martial to uh, the army. The army had to send it to the Air Force headquarters, Pennsylvania Air Force headquarters, and they fooled around with it for uh, a month or so, and uh, and, and then and then. <laughs> And then the Air Force took that outfit back over, the 805th. They took it back over, and they changed from the lieutenant, uh, uh, from the adjutant, they, they put uh, a lieutenant colonel in for the adjutant and a full colonel in, in for the uh, commander, and moved the army out. And so I was talking to the lieutenant colonel, and I had already gotten all this information had come from the army. They gave me the same same story as the Lieutenant Colonel Air Force did, and uh, he said uh, you can either request request a court martial, or you can uh, 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 do a 104. I believe it's what a 104 for extra duty, uh, or you pay a fine. What was the fine? About seventy something dollars. Seventy dollars. Yeah, that's burned up too. That's got burned up. I had that for well, years. Wait a minute. <laughs> Get this in perspective. What was your monthly wages? Oh, ten dollars and fifty cents. Okay. I had uh, I had gotten in. I had gotten into to uh, playing poker, uh, and we had some guys that were pretty good at it. It didn't take them long to break you. Um, so I did that for a couple of months, and I said, there's no, no sense of me doing this. So I, I had them to send my money back to my mother, all $10.50. And they said, we had, we had to give you $10. Anyway, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't uh, uh, not pay you at least $10. We have to pay you at least $10 every, every month. So, so you never had to pay the 70 bucks? Yeah, I did. I paid it. How did you pay it? Oh, what what the money that I got from home? <laughs> I, I the lieutenant colonel asked me. He said, "I told him I'd pay the fine." When he told me how much it was, uh, I asked him. I said, "How much is the fine?" He told me, and I said, "Well, uh, I'll pay the fine." So <laughs> he he uh, said, "Well, when do you want to pay it?" I said, uh, "I said I can have the money here in a week." Uh, he said. Uh, uh, I said, no later than payday. I said, I'll have it. I'll have it. He said, you better wait two paydays. And then take it. And I said, when you get the money, take it down to Captain Jones and have him lock it up in his safe down there for safekeeping. So I did. I took it down. I took it down to Jones and he <laughs> locked it up. And, and what's your conversation with Captain Jones go like? <laughs> well, he, he wasn't very happy. We. After after all of this, and they told me that I could uh, pay the fine and, and and be over, we were on our way back 
to our uh, to our outfit, and uh, he. Uh, well, I'm going to go back just a little bit before this and tell you about a deal when we when we when he put me in for the court martial. We were going back, and he was strutting like a little baddie rooster, you know. <laughs> and he said to me, he he said to me, he said McKay, he said, looks like I've got you this time. I said, well, we'll see, Captain. I said, so, we'll see how it turns out. And uh, so then after after uh, they told me I could pay the fine and and uh, all I we were he and I were going back and he's going with his head down and all and he he wouldn't even wouldn't, wouldn't even look at me. We were marching along there, walking along there together, and I looked over at him. I said, "Well, Captain, it looks like you failed again," and I laughed at him, and he didn't like that at all. <laughs> But I thought it was funny that he had thought so much that he could get me that easily for the general court martial, and which is Leavenworth time. If they get, if they, if they give you one, they can send you to Leavenworth for a while. And and I I knew that I knew I hadn't done anything to to go, and I knew that I could beat that court martial. But I I I said. Uh, then I'd pay the fine to get it over with. Now, the basis of the court martial, I'm a little confused. Why did he want to court martial you? Was it. I never knew. Well, was it that he thought you talked to authorities about where the parts came from? I think that was. He didn't I, know you backed him up. No, no, he didn't. And that was the basis. Yeah. He thought you squealed on him and yeah, he got out right. for that. I only thought that. I never knew it for a fact. I only, that was my thoughts after I had been out and been been the civilian for a few years. And I thought about this. This, this is this is eight or ten years, you know. Yeah. And so, uh, but I thought, I thought that could be the only reason that he would want it to would want to court martial me. Now, what was your purpose at being at Cussler Field? Well, that's where we took our basic. Okay. When when I signed up and went and joined the joined the Air Force, they were giving uh, basic training at Keesler Field, Mississippi. Was that well, Biloxi? Uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Yes, at Biloxi, right. And but then but then. Uh, in a period of time that that I uh, was trying to get in, get in the Air Force, get my dad to sign the papers and all, well, they stopped giving the basic there and moved it to Texas. Uh, okay. Yeah, Sackville is what it was. Uh, and then they gave it another name, uh, Lackland, Lackland Air Force Base is what it is. I guess it's maybe still the same thing. I don't know. But they they uh, they changed the name of it to Lackland Air Force Base, and that's where I took my basic in uh, six weeks of basic training. Okay, now you you spoke to me about all the busy work they were inventing to keep you guys busy, like policing the area. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was. This. That was it. Uh, this was where you got yourself into the first confrontation. Yeah, first okay, one. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, they shipped us. And here we are, here we are, a bunch of uh, uh, civilians that just joined. Uh, we were we're wearing civilian clothes, and uh, we went to Keystone Field, and we were supposed to get our clothing issue there. I, uh, we thought we would, and when we got when we got there, they they ran us around for a while, and then they told us that we're going to we're going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for clothing issue. Now here we are. We by this time we're getting close to a week in the same clothes. No no change. No change at all. And uh, so they shipped us up there, and then. 
and, and I was telling him about having have us police the area, you know, pick up cigarettes and butts and paper, anything that didn't grow or move, we had to pick it up. So they ran us all over that, that great big field, open field, they, and uh, they used it for, for uh, his parades and stuff, you know. When, uh, and anyway, they, uh, we came back in and we were all lined up and so he picked me out of the group and told me to step aside, so I did. And then, then they shipped the rest of the guys, they took them all and watched them somewhere else. I don't even know where they went. But he told me to pick up, he wanted me to, uh, what he did, what he did, he took, he took these uh, gallon cans, we call them butt cans, no. where people put the cigarette butts and stuff in, you know, and, and trash and stuff, where they were supposed to put them, rather than throw them on the ground. He, told, he took those and he scattered them all over the place there and told me to pick them up. Just for something to do? Yeah, and I told him I wasn't going to do it. You told him he was you I told him I wasn't going to do it and told him where to go. What? Now, <laughs> this is key. What in the world is Hadley or Hattie? Hattie? What was that now? You told me, you told him to go to Haiti or Haiti? Hades. Hades, I told Hades. You. Hades? Yeah. What in the heck is that? That's hell. Oh. <laughs> I told him to go to hell. I, 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 what in the heck is that? And I wasn't going to pick him up. And he... You know, you don't look like a belligerent source, but you're getting in an awful lot of trouble. I'm only 16. <laughs> oh, but, oh. I'm only 16 years old. I mean, your brother acts like that, but I didn't think you did. <laughs> well, I, I told him, I said, I'll be over to the barracks if you need me for anything, walk me. I said, don't you want And I just work? walked off, went back to my barracks, and I stayed there till this uh, staff, so this was a, this was a buck sergeant, the three stripe, and uh, he sent a staff over, a staff came over, and he was going to give me the military laws right there, and then and read read it, started out, and I told him, told him the same thing. I told him I wasn't going, I didn't come in the Air Force to be a, made a fool of, and I said, I'm not going to be out there doing that kind of junk. I said, we just cleaned that area up, and this, this dummy threw the cigarette butts all over the floor and told me, all over the ground, told me to pick them up, and I told him I wasn't going to do it. And I'm telling you the same thing, I'm not going to do it. I said, you do what you want to with me. And he said, you stay here and be a barracks guard. That's what he told me. And that's what I did the rest of the time I was there. And I, I never had any problem with any of them after that. They, they sent us down, shipped us from there down to another outfit. They'd move you all the time. And, and they finally gave us our clothes. And uh, I shipped off to, to Texas from a basic training. But, uh, <laughs> but they, want, they want to keep you busy. They'll do anything they can to do it. Now, somewhere along the line, you're from Mississippi. So you're a rebel. Yeah. <laughs> and you were involved with some Yanks. What, what was that situation? Oh, <laughs> well, my flight, my flight was in this barracks, and, and we were all, every one of us was from the South. Every one. First mistake. Except for one guy, and he was, he was from Ohio. But we didn't keep him very long. <laughs> I, I had a little argument with him, and I told him we were going to get rid of him, so he went, went to the commanding officer and told him he wanted to transfer. But I don't know what he thought I meant when I said we were going to get rid of him. <laughs> what I meant, we were, going, we, were going, we were going to, I meant that I was going to go to the, to the commanding officer the channels. and tell him that we needed another man in his place because he wasn't doing what he was supposed to. Oh. Uh, and see, I had a little backing. I had, I had an ex-Navy boy that, uh, that was much right with me. He, he was about that much shorter than I was. <laughs> so he, he was the last man, I was the next man on the, on the, on the left-hand side when we were in the formation. 
But anyway, he, that's what that's what happened with that. And we and and uh, that the, this other barracks were all from the north except for two men, and and they 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 called ever. Every day said, hey, Rev, the Yankees are beating on us, the Reds are beating on us. Well, we'd all jump out the windows and go out the doors and everywhere, and we'd <laughs> fall out right between the two barracks, and we'd just fight like, like cats and dogs out there. <laughs> we'd just fight like everything. I mean, actually, this, we would really fight. Somebody holler, here come the MPs, and we'd all go back to the barracks and Sitting down, everybody be busy doing something. They never knew. They never did. No, never got any of us. Never got us in trouble. They, but we we do that just every once in a while. We have to have that little fisticuff over there. Every time that I was in a group of Southern folks, sailors that kind of stuff happened. Mm -hmm. Now there'd have to be a, a strong enough contingent of both. You, you can't start a fight if you're the only Reb or if you're the only Yank. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but particularly in boot camp, a lot of Southern boys came out from Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and that kind of stuff. And of course it was strong. Mm -hmm. But never where you really got bloody. I mean, you do a lot of, I, I don't remember, it just, I never noticed it, because, you know, I'm sheltered little guy from north of Detroit, I didn't know any better. Where were you from? Detroit. Detroit? Yeah. Oh. Well, north of Detroit. Mm -hmm. I was even more sheltered. I was up in the <laughs> north part of Detroit, mm -hmm. and and it just seemed like you know I didn't even know what the Yanks and the Rebels were all about. I, yeah. I just remembered that was a good cause just to shake things up. And, oh yeah. And and a lot of the Southern guys seemed to be the aggravators. Well, some it seemed of them were. like it. Yeah. But there was always enough so that if you're going to fight, it was a trade-off. Mm -hmm. You know, there was not. Fifteen of one and one of the other. No. Well, we got we got a, about a hundred. They we went all they went all fall out, but a, a whole bunch of us would. And uh, you'd have about the same men, amount of men oh, on each yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. That went went one on one or uh, uh, one on a half a dozen or something. What went that way? Now you you told me about another story, and I. I don't recall where in this story that it happened, but you were supposed to be cleaning out the bathrooms. Oh, yeah. And you, you tore up a bathroom. Well, what happened? Oh, I, that was another story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, where, that's where Captain Jones uh, that's what he used. You asked me uh, 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 when I was talking to Jones about him, put me in for general court martial. That's where he got the, he, he got his uh, his foundation for my court martial. Oh, I see. Was set up, yeah, yeah. Why did you do that? Well, I I had been drinking a little too much. Oh. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was standing at the urinal and and uh, and I kind of staggered and and I reached up and took a hold of the the, the, the flusher and the, where it, and it all just run with, with, with regular pipes out, you know, and and I pulled it over and 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 it, and it bent the thing over, and uh, so I decided I I just push it back over where it belonged, and when it did, it started leaking, and I couldn't get it stopped. We went down, we went down, and I was visiting uh, Albrook Field. I was stationed on Howard Field in Panama. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so uh, I thought, I, well, I'll just push it back, and it started leaking, and I pulled it, and I couldn't get it stopped. We, could, we couldn't, find, couldn't even find where to turn it off. And so I went back to my outfit, and, of course, Jones got a hold of it. 
he had to get a hold of it because the guy, the charge of quarters that night had to report it, and which he did, and he knew me, and, and he, he didn't want to. He said he didn't, he didn't want to tell him who did it, but he's, that's all he could do. You know, I mean, that's the way things are. And so Jones said, well, um, I went, I went, I went over there to, to Albrook Field for oh, a number of times, and I talked to talked to the officers over there. I never did talk to the uh, commanding officer of Albrook. I talked to the, uh, the the man who was in charge of the military police, the one I did most of my talking to, and he told me he said, "I'm gonna get you out of this." He said, "Why don't you ever do something like that again?" I said, well, uh, I said, I promise. So uh, what he did, he uh, he talked to the, the base adjutant, which was a good friend of his, and he told him uh, what had happened. And he was going, he said uh, he, wanted, he wanted them to settle it and just drop the charges. So he said, uh, he said he would. And so he called me back over there, and I went back to Albrook Field, and he told me, he said, uh, we got an appointment with the, with the, with the base, um, uh, uh, the base adjutant, and he said, uh, you, and we're going to meet the base commander as he comes out, this, we're supposed to be there at a certain time. He said, he said we're supposed to be there at 12 o'clock. Sharp. I'm not, that's not the time he told me, but I'm just saying. He said 12 o'clock, and he said then we got to be there. He said, but we're not going to be there. He said we're not going to we're not going to even go to that meeting. He said because he'll come out of that door or that building. Uh, their headquarters, base headquarters, were here, and the and military. Police were down here, and wasn't anything between us and that in the headquarters. But he says he's gonna come out that door at exactly 12:01. He said he'll come out that door at exactly 12:01. He said, and we're gonna meet him at the door. I said I'm gonna open the door for him. So he comes out. So he's sitting there watching. He said, "Come on, let's go." And so we took off. Almost running, I, I, hard for me to keep up with him. So uh, we got there, and he he opened the door, and there's a there's the base commander standing right there. He said, "Sir," he said, "I'm sorry we're late, but he said uh, uh, I've got I've got McKay here. That we're supposed to uh, we're supposed to meet you at a certain time." And he said, "Look," he said, "Well," he said. I'm on my way home now," he said. Uh, "Take him up to the adjutant," said he. Uh, he and he had already told me the police officer had already told me. He said, "You won't even have to." He said, "You won't even have to go before him because I've already got it settled." He said, "It's all settled." He said, "But we got to go through the formality of it." And so, so the base commander left, and the, and the military police officer told me. Said you just stay down here. He said I'll go up, and Take care of it. and he went up, came back. He said, "Don't ever come over here and do something like that again." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "You bet. I won't be back over here for the." I said, uh, "Watch what I drink." It's tough on a sixteen-year-old. 16, 17. Well, I mean, he 17. can't be 16 his whole career. No, I, I know. You know, and he's got to be at least 17 now. Or I'm 18. 17, yeah. That's not much better. I'm 17 before I finished my basic. Uh, the 3rd of August. You must have had a pretty good in with the officers. Seemed like other than Captain Jones, you got along with most well, of your superiors pretty well. Here's the way I always felt about it. You do what you're supposed to do, and you tell the truth. I, ne I never told a, I never told a, well, maybe I may have. <laughs> I won't say this either. I better not say that because I, 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 have, I have told a few 
tails that weren't fibs. fibs. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The light wings are called fibs, well, not an outright line. Well, I told you about all, about the boy that uh, Joe Edcock that I thought he might have might have uh, insinuated or told that I got the parts from Captain Jones and uh, I, I I I kept him from going back to to the brig by telling him that uh, what what they were charging with was false. And I had two of them. I had two boys the same thing. I told him one boy. I said. I can't do it. I said, they're not going to take one line uh, for two people. And I said, I'll have to come up with something new. <laughs> and I said, I don't think I can do it. And uh, so, but, but I got Joe out and he didn't have to go back, but, but uh, uh, the other boy did. <laughs> when you were working on those Packard V12s. Were these boat motors? Yeah. 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 Those are the similar type engines used <coughs> in the PT boats. Yes. Uh, I never, I never uh, saw the engine in a PT boat. You didn't? No. no. I never did. Well, next time you come down, we'll take you over to the Packard Proving Grounds and we'll show you. Okay. A PT boat and a couple of those Packard V12 engines. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? That'd be great. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, See, regardless of what he tells you, I'm a pretty nice guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? You know that? Uh, those were pretty good engines. Yes, that, they were. That, that Packard V. That V12. And when you say good, you mean dependable. Yes, they were. Very yep. powerful and very dependable. I changed those engines and and. Uh, I put two new ones in that boat on, uh, uh, during the Christmas holidays in 1949. That was, that was my duty. They gave me a boy from San Antonio, Texas, a corporal, to work with me. And uh, another, <laughs> another old boy from Mississippi that uh, almost kicked him off of my boat, almost literally kicked him off of my boat. And I, Your boat? The one I was assigned to. Funny how you get ownership of those you things. You do though. Yeah. You do. And here's what happened. I was, I was getting, I was getting the boat ready to, to change engines in. And, uh, and I, no, I had already changed the engines. And this was, uh, this was just after that, a day or two after Christmas. I was changing the Colombian bronze shift system so that uh, we could shift from the bridge, you know. And uh, and I took I took off some uh, some oil filters and put them in and put them in a pail. And I told I told this guy name was Davis, and I told him I said don't don't bother these things. I knew where he was. I, I knew he was a meddler <laughs> and I would mess things up because uh, uh, our chief, uh, chief well, he called us engineers, we were mechanics, but they called us engineers and our chief engineer told him one time, said, clean out that tool, toolbox there, Davidson. He said, what, what do you mean? He said, throw everything over the sides, it's no good. He just threw everything over. All kind of tools. I, and the next, <laughs> and I caught him doing it, and and I stopped him. And uh, but this time, I told him, "See, we we quit for a little. We're gonna take a smoke. We both of us smoke. I don't know whether David smokes or not, but me and the, the boy from Texas smoked. So we stopped and went, and went for a little little break, and uh, told Davis to come on." He just stayed down there. He wouldn't even stay, stay, stay in the engine room. And when we went down, he came out. And I heard something go, boom. Oh, no, I said. And I told him when he came up, I was going down the hatch and he was coming up. I said, don't bother those, those that can, that pail there. Leave it sitting right there. Don't even touch it. That's what I told him. And, 
And I didn't know it, but Carrillo told him the same thing. He told him, Davis, don't you, don't you uh, fool with those things now. We heard it go over the side. Uh -oh. I went up, I went up on the deck. Here he came with that pail, sling it like this, empty. I said, did you throw that stuff over the side? Yep. And I grabbed him. He's a great big old tall boy. <laughs> I grabbed him by the nap of the neck and I ran him over to the edge of the boat and I was just about ready to, to boot him. <laughs> and I turned him loose. I said, get off this boat. And I said, don't you ever come back on my boat again. If I'm on that boat, you don't come on it. And I said, I don't care who sends you. You tell them you have orders, you can't come back on that boat. So I went up to the, went up to the order room and told the, told the first sergeant and our commanding officer was in the next room and he heard it. And I guess I was pretty loud. <laughs> and you guess said, what? I guess I was pretty loud when I was telling the first sergeant about it. And he called me in there and he said, I wonder if that was, if what I was telling was true. I said, yes, it's true. And uh, so he called Davis and told him, I, I went on back down to, I went on back down to, my, to the boat. And uh, while I was down there, they called Davis to come up to the oil room and they called me to come with him. And, and so I went up with him and we told us, we told us, I told the story as I had told it before. and. Uh, Mr. Drake asked him, said, uh, is, is what McKay's telling you right? Telling me, is that right? He said, yes, sir. He said, well, why did you throw that stuff over the side after he told you not to? He said, I don't know. <laughs> That's what he told him. <laughs> said, I don't know. But he was that kind of guy. He do stuff, and I don't know why in the world he did them. And the stuff you told me, you seem to have adapted to this mechanic phase. I mean, you're a cotton farmer. What the hell did you know about mechanic? Well, we had, uh, of course, back in, in 1946 and uh, before, you. We didn't have many tractors. There was a few old John Deere's around and a few farm halls, and we had a little farm hall. And I work on that and other tools and stuff, you know, uh, that you work farm with. I work on that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, so that was your formal introduction to Mechanicsville, I right? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was. And I, uh, and I just kind of enjoyed it. I I enjoyed working uh, on the on the engines and stuff. And Cause these says Packard engines are pretty pretty big, pretty complicated. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, was nice. I enjoyed that. So mm -hmm. I'd take engine out, put one in. I'd take an engine apart and work on it. The only one thing that I that I I was that I didn't get to do that I wanted to. We had a. When we were at Franceville working on that on that uh, uh, runway, extending the runway in Franceville, we had uh, we had also had out on the ocean front. We had uh, a, I had a llama shovel out there. I say I had it. It was my responsibility to make sure it ran all the time. And uh, and uh, and a D four uh, cat out there that we pushed the coral and stuff with. And somehow the guy ran that off, ran that that uh, day four off in the ocean, <laughs> and it, it I guess it caved off, caved in. That's a pretty big dozer, isn't it? Four? No, it's the smallest. About one of the smallest we had. We had a D, we had a D four, D six, D and a D eight. Uh, uh, no D nines. Yeah. I'm familiar with the D nines. Yeah. They were using them in coal mining. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big mm -hmm. monsters. Yeah, they are. Yeah, that's and and uh, I didn't get to, I didn't get to repair that that uh, D four. I wanted to I wanted to take it down, take it apart, and redo it. But they 
they sent it to BCL, which is a, a their higher rated uh, mechanic deal in a way where they they didn't go to the field; they had the stuff all brought to them. Mm. And that's I wanted to to work on that, and I didn't get to do it. Now you were given a choice, as I recall, to select the next stage of your life, which is Sea Rescue. Was that out of Panama? Yes. You see, when when uh, when Jones put me in for general court martial, uh, he that gave me an automatic transfer. Win, lose, or draw, you get a, you automatically get a transfer. Well, I didn't know this, but Jones did, and Jones knew that he wasn't going to get to bust me, and he wasn't happy at all about it. But but uh, they sent me to the Air Force headquarters. They called for me over there, and they told me I had two choices. I could go to the sea rescue, or I could work on the base as a, I said, I'm a diesel mechanic, and I want to work where there's diesel, where there's diesel work. I want to learn more about diesel, is what I want to learn. And he said, uh, well, he said, we got a lot of work everywhere. This is Lieutenant Colonel I'm talking to. And I said, uh, he said, we sent all the screwballs to the boat outfit. I said, send me over there then. I said, that's what you do. Send me over there. We had, had one guy that had been sent over there. Randall was his name. And uh, he, he was over there too. But I didn't, I didn't see him or talk to him. I didn't, I didn't even know where, where the uh, sea rescue base was. But it was on Rodman Naval Station where it was. So was that where you worked on the diesels? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How big of boats were you working on? Oh, gee, because they, they, they run from the smaller boats up in the, in the uh, well, they didn't have the diesels in them. About a 54, 52, 54 footer up uh, to 65. They had, they had diesel. You see, what we did, we had a, that was, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, what do you call that when they, when, when they, when they uh, furnish uh, recreation for, for military people. Uh, and, and they just, they call over and they say they want, they got a group wants to go fishing. And they just put them all on and take them. And uh, you know, uh, whatever the crowd is. Part of the recreational program. Yeah, that's what it. That's what it was, and they had a. We had a number of boats. R and R. Yeah. Restoration. Recreation and. It wasn't just a sea rescue. We had two eighty-five footers, two sixty-three footers, and uh, we had the general boats set there, and, and under the shed, nobody, nobody ever went on it but the cook. And hardly ever saw it go out. He'd go once in a while. Did you did you tell me about now that you spoke about fishing? Did you tell me about one time when you were fishing? I forgot where it was. Catching fish, and you brought them over to the officers. Oh, boat. yeah, that was that was down on uh, down in Columbia. Oh. We, this was a Navy captain. He had gone down fishing and he had to have some fuel. So we loaded up some barrels and set them on the deck of the 85 footer that I was assigned to. And we took off down and took it to him. Well, uh, Andy and I were, DeGamo, uh, Andy and DeGamo and I were, were fishing off our boat. And we were, he saw us cleaning these fish. He said, and, and he he needed some cigarettes, and so I, I had a I had to get in the dinghy and take him some cigarettes over. Was that that wasn't in payment for the fuel, was it? No, no, but <clears throat> no, we we gave him the fuel, but uh, we got over there and he said he said what are you guys gonna do with those fish? I said we're gonna cook them. He said you can't eat that. He what said, kind of fish was it? I don't know. 
They which, just look good, eh? They look, they look like it would, be, it would be good. He said, they look good. He said, you want some good good fish? And I said, yeah. He said, did you ever see a fish called a dolphin? I don't mean the dolphin itself, but a fish that is actually called a, a dolphin. Yeah. He said, we got, I've got one. He said, would you like to have it? He says, it's good fish. And I said, yes, I'd like to have it. But he says, it's about 12 pounds. I said, that'll be great. That'll be enough for all of us. See, we had, we had uh, our, our captain, who was a mess sergeant, uh, we had him and had uh, some more guys that were on special rations. They were married and were living off the base. And so they, when, when they got on that boat, they ate everything we had in the, in the freezers that was for us. That was for the guys. We really didn't have any food left. We didn't have the food left. That's right. So I told him we were going to eat them, and uh, he gave us he, he gave us those fish. And I took it back over there and I cooked them. We weren't cooks, but we cooked them, and, and we both knew how to cook. So but we just we just cooked them up. Were they good? Oh yeah, they were good. Yeah, I don't know. It's um. It's a stub nose fish like this, yeah. a dolphin is. I remember what it looked like, and uh, uh, I remember what it, it was. It was a very good fish. Now you're getting close to your second uh, discharge, 1950. Yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> just before that, there was an accident back home. Yeah. What was that all about? Uh, my my family, Jim was in that in that car. Uh, he and, and my younger brother, and my mother and dad, and my dad made a left hand turn on the highway, uh, and the guy hit him broadside on the side where my mother was sitting, and I almost killed her. She was broken, up. just about all the bones in her body. Limbs and all were broken. The hips were broken. The arms were broken. Collarbone was broken. <clears throat> her legs were broken, and she was in terrible shape. And my dad, had this knuckle on his on his shoulder here was under his under his arm, and it was about the biggest thing that he got. But uh, uh, that was that same morning. That same morning, I was in Panama, and. They called me and told me, and, and what I was doing, you remember I said something about uh, Davis throwing away my my shift, my filters and all on the Columbia Bronze system. That was, and that's what I was doing that morning, was putting that, going to put that back together. And uh, they called me and told me that, uh, that we'd had an accident at home and uh, want me to said, get, get dressed, you know, pack all your stuff. And I packed everything I had in a duffel bag. And uh, they took me to Albrook Field. And this is, a, I've never seen this happen before, nor since. But they took me over there. They processed me. They paid me and, and, uh, and, and uh, got me a flight out within, within two hours. And I was on my way back to the States, free man. Ready to come home for. Uh, now this was June, July, 1950. No, no, that was in March, 1950. Okay. I believe, no, it, it was. It was right after Christmas. Yeah. yeah. it was in January. Yeah, it was January. Well, your discharge went through on. On the on the 26th, I of, think, or the 6th. Of June. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was discharging. They sent me back to Keystone Field, and that's where I stayed at Keystone. Korea. I stayed in Bodak. The Korean Island. War started Korean on War. the 25th. Yeah, yeah, it did. And I uh, I took my brother back, the one that was in the Army. See, he had he had spent over two years, about two years over there in uh, Japan and then in, in Korea. That's a glam he's talking about. And so, so he, uh, uh, 
it came, it came, this was the 4th of July, uh, when, when this happened. Uh, uh, everybody was getting off for the 4th, you know, uh, for vacation on the 4th. I quit my job that morning. And uh, they worked me 22 hours without a break, without the time off. And I said, that's enough, I don't need that. And I only wanted part-time work because I was going to go to school. See, well, I did, I did have education your, on my mind. I didn't so get much of it. This was before. after your discharge? Huh? This was after your discharge? Yes, I was, yeah. I okay. was already home. <clears throat> yeah, I got discharged on the 3rd, I think it was about the 3rd of June, somewhere around there. And then, uh, then the 25th, the Korean War started, I think it was 25th. And, uh, and Glenn was on his way home, was on the boat, already on the way home. <clears throat> the morning I quit, the morning I quit my job, I saw this soldier coming down the street. He was looking, you know, here, looking here. And I said, that boy was looking for some, something, an address or something. And I, and, I, and he got a little bit closer and I said, that guy looked kind of familiar. And uh, I wasn't close enough so yet to see who it was. And then a few, a few minutes later, I said, well, no wonder you this. I said, my brother. <laughs> so I loaded him in the car and we went home. And the next day, I believe, he got a telegram to report back to, to uh, I don't know whether he said California or Washington, but he was to report back for duty. He said, you're going back to Korea. And uh, I said, forget it, just stay home. He, I said, you just got here. Stay a, stay a little while and then you go back. No, he said, I can't do that. They put me in a break. I said, I got it all figured out. I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> I said, I'll take care of it. And uh, I said, you stay, stay a while. And I said, here's what we'll do. I'll take you to Keys the Field. I'll, and uh, you, go, you go in down there and tell them you're reporting for duty. You don't have the money to go back on, and they'll have to transport you. He said, will that work? I said, yeah, it'll work. It has to work. Uh, and, and I said, the, and the Air Force will get you back. So uh, he did. He stayed about two more days, and he said, I got to go. I got to go. So I took him down. And that's, while I was down there, I went over to, to re-enlist in the Air Force. So now you're re-enlisting for the third time? Yeah. For, uh, during the Korean War. What, what, what's your dad thinking? You know, every time you come home, he thinks he's got <laughs> someone to bail cotton, and all of a sudden you blow that off and go back in again. Well, he knew I wasn't going to do it. No. He knew I wasn't going, I wasn't going to stay on the farm. What'd your mom have to say about all that? Well, she knew that that's the way it was going to be, so she didn't. Were, were you considered a pretty stubborn person? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> he might think so, <laughs> but I don't well, think Well, there's no question he is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, uh, I usually, I consider myself usually on the right side. Mm -hmm. And I always try to do that. I always try to stay on the right side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, well, we've had, my dad and I wasn't always peace, you know. No. Uh, was he stubborn too? My dad? No. Not like I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were both. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so you so you go back in again? Yeah. Where did they send you then? Sent me to Washington, D.C. at Bowling Field. For the purpose of? Oh, just. Going to go back into mechanics? Yeah, that's what I went. I went to a boat outfit. I went to the sea rescue outfit there. All we did was haul generals around on those boats. From see, they had a they had a lot of uh, housing for high-ranking officers on that on uh, uh, on the base there, and they'd go to the Pentagon every day for work. That's where they do, and we'd haul them up up to Potomac to the Pentagon. Went to, it's just right across from. Uh, I can't even remember the name of that. You guys probably know the air base there. Uh, 
Huh? Andrews. Andrews. No, Andrews was in the military. Uh, and, and it was in Maryland. Andrews was. This was, uh, this was right on the river. Uh, we had one plane that crashed from Ohio there, and we had to get the three bodies out. I had just gotten off duty that morning, so I didn't have to do, uh, I wasn't involved in it. What, what did you think about going back in now that there was a war starting? Did you think maybe you'd be involved in that? Well, I, I knew I could be. I didn't bother you? No. No, it didn't. We had, uh, we had one boy that was at, uh, and I can't remember who he was now, at, at, uh, at, Bo at uh, Washington. Uh, it, he went over, to, he went to Korea, and he, they shot three boats off of money. Some three of them he was on. Hmm. And uh, I heard about it, but I didn't, I never did see him after that. Once you get in a boat outfit, you just, it's just like being in an old folks' home. You go to back there, it's the same thing. They, they keep it's sending you back. Yeah, it's the best duty you can get in the military. And apparently there were still few people with your background in boat mechanics, huh? Yeah, they did. Yeah, that's true. A lot of them they put in. They didn't. They didn't know much about what. They didn't know much about mechanics. But mechanics is something that that I studied. Uh, I went to school. I went to school twice. That's like a guy that's failed, you know, and they got to send it back. And so I, I failed because I took a discharge, and uh, and I had to go back to it again. Now this was a period of time when we were. Moving from piston planes to jet aircraft. I'm sorry, I didn't. In the 50s is when we converted from piston driven planes oh, yeah. to, to jet engines. Yes, yeah. Did, yeah. did that have any effect on the boats you were working with? No, no, it did not on the boat, no. Oh. We still use the V-12 package. When I when I changed engines in that 85 footer, I put two new V-12 packages in. And did it during the Christmas holiday. What else? Now you said you were in Washington. Did you spend the rest of your three-year enlistment in Washington? No. Uh, I was. Uh, let's see, I went there in June and April, April I think the next year, the next year uh, I went, they sent me to Capsona, California and I was there and shipped from, from Stoneman to, to uh, uh, Okinawa. Uh, now, what was the purpose of you being shipped to Okinawa? I wasn't certain. <laughs> they had a boat. was kind of unusual because you were only six months from being from discharged. This, right. Uh, they, uh, yeah, that's what I had about six months ago. And, but they had a boat there that they had, they said had been, been uh, had been moved for a year because they couldn't get it to run. And uh, so they sent they sent me and two more two more uh, supposed to be mechanics. One was an ex Navy uh, machinist. The other he was a master sergeant. Then they they had a tech sergeant who had been a warrant officer maintenance. Uh, he had been a warrant officer uh, maintenance man. He, uh, he was in charge of. In the boat outfit, he was he was in charge of the of the of maintenance in the boat outfit, and that was his duty. And they sent me along with them, and I don't know what far to mop the oil up. I guess they spilled. But anyway, we got we got there, and the CO 
we had, we just walked in the, and reported, and he had told us to go down and look at that boat. He wanted that boat running. And I don't know whether he thought, maybe maybe that's what they told him we were coming for, to fix that boat. What was the use of the boat? It's a 63-footer, and they used it for uh, sea rescue, just like it did there. See, the, the 63s they used, and that 85s they used. Uh, were, were these big cabin cruisers, or? Well, Spot tops. The 85 looked like a PT boat. Okay. It's about the same thing. Uh -huh. The 63 is built similar to the 85, but it's not. It's but it's not, all steel. Not boats. as big, yeah. They're no, steel. They're wood. They're wood. Yeah. They're wood boats. Plywood hulls. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they were like the PTs. Yeah, they were. They were oh. just like the PTs. Even we even had the uh, on 85. We had the. Uh, uh, turrets for the machine guns and all. Oh my god. But goodness. we didn't, we didn't, I never was on one where they, where they had the machine gun. Uh, we, we just, we just uh, followed. Now, each of those boats had twin, twin engines? Yes, they both had. They, they wouldn't necessarily run on both, but. I forgot what. It seemed there are certain sizes where they always had two two engines. You run on one and then they shut that one down and do the maintenance needed and put the other one. Yeah. So that they were never caught out to sea without any engine. Yeah. I mean that was the theory, but Well oh uh, we we'll go back go back a little bit to the to the, to the recreational uh, end of the stuff in Panama. Uh, this this one boat they they had sent out that morning uh, with, a, with, and I don't know who, I don't know who, uh, who they took it out for, but they, uh, when they when they got out there, their engine uh, began to not fire right, and it's a diesel engine, and uh, but it wasn't firing right. So he called back in and said they were on their way back, uh, and. Uh, and the engineer, when he got there, our commanding officer was there. I happened to be on duty that night. On on a was a night that we worked one on two off, one on two off. What we did stood 24 hours and then two off. And I happened to be, I happened to be on the dock with the 45 on. And uh, and uh, when they came in, well, our commanding officer was there. And he was reporting to our commanding officer, telling him what was wrong with the boat. And uh, he said, "Well, uh, Drake said to him, so, well, how long did it take to fix it?" Oh, he said, "Oh, he said it might take three or four days to fix that boat." And I and I had heard what he said was wrong with it, so I told Gerald Taylor, the guy was on my crew, I said, "That boy don't know what he's talking about. Uh, uh, he, he don't know what's wrong with that boat or something." I said, if what he said is wrong with that boat, I said, I can fix that thing in 15 minutes. <laughs> and he went and told, told our CEO, he said, give Taylor that 45 and come on. And so we went down and looked at the boat, and he says, can you fix it? I said, if I got the part, I said, I, I'll, I said 15 minutes. I said, I believe I can do it in 15 minutes. What was the part? It was a... Uh, uh, the, the fuel, the fuel pump. It's got a uh, a, a disc that's uh, fiber or rubber that goes in, hooks on, hooks onto the pump, hooks onto this other portion that pumps the fuel into the, in, the into the injectors. And all I had to do was take that off. It's about about six bolts. All you got to do is just just take those off and put this other one on, and it, but it was still running. It was still running. It, it, it was just it had broken out a couple of the holes, but it was still run on the on the one that was. So all I had to do was take that left piece of fiber uh, insulation there uh, uh, and put it on, and it it run. That's all it took. How did you know that from just listening to the engine? I just listened to the guy. And I knew he didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> and so I said, 
so I went down and looked at it, and uh, I told Drake, you know what he told me? He's, he had a he had a lieutenant friend who was in the Navy, and so he called him and told him said, what we need what we needed. He said, I don't know where we got them out, but he said, he looked. He said, we don't have any. He said, they had two machine shops there, boats, great big ships, machine shops. You in the Navy? Then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and they were sitting there, and he told me, he said, come on, uh, this lieutenant of the Navy said, come on, if there's anything on these boats that'll fit that, you can have it. All you got to do is take it off and put it on, on your boat. So they were kind of just sitting there scrapped? No, they weren't scrapped. They were still, they, they still, Oh, really? <laughs> they were <laughs> using them. I was going to let you go grab some stuff off it? He said, oh. I can have it. He said, if you find it, you have it. That's what he told me. <laughs> and I said, I looked the whole, I looked both of those. I said, it won't fit. Well, I had just come out of the 805th the, the, the Aviation Engineers. That's what I, that's why I was in the boat outfit. I got kicked uh -huh. out. And they had, they had all of their stuff stacked out there, spread out, to load on the ship to come back to the States. They were coming back, and I'd been over there for a few months, see. And they were, and my, my CEO says, anything out there fit on that stuff? I said, <laughs> I laughed, I kind of chuckled, and I said, everything out there will fit Because I worked on all of it. And, uh, he said, well, go get us, go get us one. I said, give me a direct order, I'll go get it. I said, that's the only way. I said, I won't take it out, I won't take it off without it. He said, well, we both get in trouble like that. I said, I'm not going by myself. <laughs> I said, if you want it, you give me a direct order, we'll go. And I, uh, he went back and told him, said, no. He didn't have anything. He said, but, Told him, said, all that stuff out there fit it. Said, told him what I said it would fit. Got up the next morning, that boat was gone. That guy, that, that so he, he went out and got one. I know what he did. <laughs> but see, if what I had, had if I had done? done that, if I had taken it all, and Jones found out that it's the only way in the world he ever found out that the guy, he wanted to be in Leavenworth, so he just, he just sent me. <laughs> and I said, you are not sending me to Leavenworth. So how do you think he got it? Here's what, here's what it's with a tool, one out there and took it off. He went with who? With some tools and took them off. How the hell did he know how to take them off? Who? The guy that went to get it. Oh, well, he's he's supposed to be a mechanic. Oh. Yeah, he's supposed to be a mechanic. The one that said it was going to take several days? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's the one. Boy. I, I assume he's the one that took it off. I don't know. I don't oh, know who okay. took it off. But it was gone, the boat was gone next morning back in duty. It was out to sea. They were fishing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no big rescue. It was just fishing. Yeah. yeah they <laughs> that's just fishing. important, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what they were doing, fishing. They had Did all... you ever get that other ship started up, the one that had been sitting there for a year? Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good story. We went down the next morning. And went to work on that. On that, me and those two, uh, two uh, sergeants, and I, they they fooled around a little bit. And I said, Sergeant, if you do that and so, I said it might run. He said to me, I must say the words he said. He said, Sergeant, you don't know a damn thing about it. That's just what he said to me. I said, Well, if you want my assistance, I'll be somewhere in the area. Just call for me, come get me or whatever. But I said, I'll, I'll be, I'll be around. And I just excused myself and and went up on the deck and went on the back of the boat and went everywhere. And I sat for a while in the engine room, watched them fool around, and try to get it started. Wouldn't start. We went to lunch, came back, worked. They worked till mid afternoon. Then he looked at me and he said, well, Sergeant, we'll try it your way. I said, then I'll help you. I went up there and I said, get out of my way. <laughs> and dismissed both of them. And I timed the engine and I told the guy, I said, hit the switch. <laughs> and 
and the commander and officer, I don't know how he got there so quick, but he says, you got it started. I said, yes, sir. It started. How long did it take you? About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes all it took. And, and he, the commander and officer rolled over and said, can we take it out? I said, yes, sir, we can take it out. I just took over the engine room. The, the, the other two, they didn't know what to do in any way. And that way, every time I ever had a dealing with either one of them, they just didn't know. They weren't, or neither, wasn't either of them mechanics. I had the same deal with, with another, with another uh, man who was in charge of a six, uh, 63 footer. And uh, I went over, went a, <laughs> we had gotten a new commanding officer and I wasn't there that morning when he, when he came on duty. So you can imagine what he, what he thought about me. <laughs> but I didn't have a duty day, I had a day off. And I was, wasn't on base for roll call the next morning. That was a problem. And uh, so, so he, just, he said, I was, I was living on the 85 footer and I didn't like it. And he told me I was going, he's going to re remove me from that and I was going to work the 63 footer. So I, Simon's a six three footer. I went over there, <clears throat> and this sergeant was fooling with it, with the engine. He had a, he had it unbolted, unbolted the engine unbolted from the rear. I said, what, I asked him what he was doing. He told me. I said, uh, I'll not help. I got out there and, <laughs> and uh, I checked the, I checked the engine. He said, what he told me. He said this engine's out of line. He said this, this engine's out of line. It's off. Off the grade list, and out of line. I worked on it a little bit, and I said, "You're wrong, Sergeant. It's, it's, the engine's right where it's supposed to be." You know, he, he was. We'd argue like everything about it, and and uh, our maintenance officer came in. He said, "Well, no, I was going." He said, well, "Oh, we'll have it a little while." I said, "He won't ever get it because he don't know what he's doing." I said, "That the engine's right where it's supposed to be." I said, you got a bent shaft or a bent strut? That's what you got on this boat. That's the reason it vibrates. And he, that other guy, that uh, made this man up, he said, he would argue that I, that I was wrong. It wasn't what it was, it was the engine. Nothing wrong with the engine. So we, uh, uh, Walton said, not Walton, uh, Drake said, uh, Drake said, uh, stay with him till tomorrow on it, his, uh, today on it. He said, if we don't get it by, by today, he said, we'll take it out in the morning, we'll have the boat pulled out and look. Of course, everybody in, everybody in my outfit knew that we'd had that little argument, you know. So they're all there that morning when they put the straps on, picked that boat up, and it struts sitting over here like this. <laughs> well, uh, Obviously, it can be that that's what it was. Everybody hollered, hey, yeah. <laughs> that's what it was. Fix it and then, but it won't problem. What you have to do, bend it out or take it yeah. off and replace it? Take it, took it? I think they took it off. I didn't, I didn't even fool with it. I just told them what was wrong with it. And they took it off and, and uh, put a new strut on. What did your buddy have to say about that? He didn't like it at all. They, a they blew me back on the, on the base and sent me home. <laughs> <laughs> now you'd be what, 21? Huh? I would, uh, you'd be age, about 21 now? I'm about 20, about 23. 23? Yeah. 20, well, let's see, that no. was, that was, you no. Went, you went in. I, Bobby, I was 22 at that time. Yeah. Right? That I was 23 when I came home. See, part of your problem is you're short and you're too damn young. <laughs> None of those old timers wanna. Oh, I know. Well, what the heck could he know? <clears throat> they didn't think I knew anything. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But I, I had enough experience that I, I could tell. I used to keep all our cars running. After, I, after I got married, moved, uh, we moved to Michigan. Oh, my mom and dad. And, uh, all now, my, 
brothers? Sometime along in this time period, your mom and dad decided to come up. Yeah. Why? Because I, I talked to my dad. Uh, one reason he didn't have any help. You know, uh, he he hired help. He, he always had to hire people that uh, to work on the farm. But he didn't he didn't have a, Jim work. Jim works on it. He's but, old enough to work on it then. But keep in mind though that that our mother had been in that accident, and she was no longer able to work on the farm. Mm-hmm. Because she just could. Yes, true, she would. And I suspect at that time, cotton farming was starting to fall off. No, they still think that's the biggest money in the world farming. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I guess per acre, you make more money on cotton than you do any rest any the rest of it. Mm -hmm. How how big a spread did you have? We only had 80 acres. Wow. We had we we had rented. Uh, what? We owned sixty. And uh, we owned sixty. No, eighty. It was eighty. Wasn't it? No, I don't think so. Huh? I don't think so. I thought it was eighty. I'm not wrong. It just, seemed, it just seemed like that. Yeah. <laughs> I know it didn't take long to get it. And then you rented how much? Did you rent? Oh, we had we had. Uh, yeah, not there. Because, see, my dad was doing most of the farming himself at that time. Uh, but before I left, we had a, we rented, I don't even know how many acres was in that farm. How'd you pick all that cotton? By hand. Just you guys yeah. and the family? Yeah. You didn't bring in all oh, these no, no, no. slaves and yeah, we brought it build up a big plantation? and All the slaves we could find, we got it. Boy, that's that's. A I had one guy. I had one guy. Not. I, I never. I don't think I ever ever picked two hundred pounds in a day in my life. I tried it, but I just couldn't do it. And I wait. I was waiting for my dad one time. We had you, you pick. They pick, and then they they weigh what they what they pick, and they get paid for that. And I had one guy on there. That rascal picked over over 500 pounds and I waited and he quit early in the afternoon. He said he and his buddy could pick uh, about 15, 1600 pounds a, a day. I said, how in the world do you do it? I, I picked it along beside him for a while just to try to see how he did it. I, Can I you imagine 500 pounds of cotton? Yeah. That's a lot of money, a lot of cotton. Yeah, I mean, cotton weighs nothing. Can you imagine how much cotton they must have picked? Well, I can't imagine 500 pounds of cotton. That's a, well, it's got seed on it yet. Is that that's one one reason it weighs it weighs uh, weighs up pretty fast. But it is a lot cleaner than, than the way they pick it today with the, with the machines. Oh yeah, it's yeah. a lot cleaner. Well, you I got pick it with your hands. The first. Time I got discharged, that's what I was. I said I'm going to go home, buy me a cotton picker, and uh, start picking cotton. This, uh, because they had just started making them in, in, in 1946, and uh, I thought I'd come home buy one, and uh, I, and I found out that they were a little a little bit expensive, and uh, they. They didn't do as good a job as, as uh, you didn't pick it clean like you do when you hand pick it. They just go in there and put that thing kind of like... It's all rough on the hands too, it's kind of it? like It's kind of like stripping, uh, stripping corn. You know, when, they, when you pick corn, it dries and you're picking corn and with a machine, either take the ear off and uh, even shell it now. They even shell the corn. And, 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 I haven't seen them do it, but uh, I know it's, I know they do because they'll come in and pour it in them in one of these big trucks and have all kinds of stuff in it. But that's the way the cotton was, and they 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 weren't happy with that. They finally got it clean though, where it cleans it out pretty good. So your dad came up to get in the auto industry. Yeah, I I talked him into it. Uh, 
he first said he wasn't going to do it, and he's kind of that by that like he was signing my papers for me to go in the Air Force. Uh, I was home on Christmas, uh, and in in uh, fifty one, fifty one, fifty two, and uh, and I told him, uh, I said, Dad, it's it's not bad. It's, you get pretty good pay, and I said. Uh, it's not not the hardest farming. Oh yeah. And uh, so he he came up in March. Came up and and uh, uh, he he hired in in the same the same shop I was in in the crankshaft department. When 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 you were going to be discharged again, why didn't you just stay in the Air Force? Well, I mean, you're already in six yeah. or seven years. Yeah, I had sent by six years uh, active duty. Well, I would have, but uh, I had never had what I could call a job, you know. And I, one of the boys asked me, uh, and I can't, I can't remember that boy's name now, but, but they didn't, didn't know him long. I just met him when I went back to Keith the field. He said, Mac, what you going to do? I said, I'm going to look for a job. I said, I really never had a job. I, I, I had worked at different places. I told you about me working 22 hours at, at this one place. I worked at Kroger Baker then. And uh, I had worked in places, and, but it wasn't something I could call a job that I wanted to stay with, you know, and, uh, and something that I could, could consider making a living with for the rest of my life. And I said, I'm going to find me a job if I can. And I said, if I don't find it, you'll see me back in the Air Force. If I come back this time, I'll stay till I retire. And, uh, and I, came, I came to Michigan. And Why did you come to Michigan? Just the auto industry? He, he told me, he said, uh, go to Pontiac or Flint. He said, my brother just hired in at Pontiac. And I came up here the day that Eisenhower was... Uh, elected president. Yeah. The next morning, I went out and hired him, and I and I, I said I quit that job too. You did? Yes, I quit it. What'd you do that for? Because the other former cussed at me, <laughs> <laughs> and I said I don't work for people like you. You're kidding. Yeah. So what were you doing at that time? I was working crankshaft department. They weighed 98 pounds when they were finished, and you'd get one in each hand go around them, like that. Were you actually cutting them and shaping them? And yeah, I was straightening, straightening them. Uh, I'd put it on a machine, and, and uh, if you'd have to turn it over and then, uh, with the dials on it, you know, and then you'd, you'd hit it with a, with a press. Straighten it, straighten it, and when it, when you got it straightened, you gave it to them, and they ground it, and and. Uh, now you're talking about a crankshaft or a camshaft? Crankshaft. That's the ones that are. Yep. Yep. Now those are all pieces that fit together in there, aren't no. they? No, they they uh, they put that in a mold and make it and mold it in that in that position, and then they take it out, and they'll. They'll uh, uh, run a lathe over, over. I think it's two of the main, two of the mains on it. I think what they, uh, well, they ran, they ran a, they ran a lathe on on most of, of the throws on it. You know where the mm -hmm. rods fasten on, and uh, and and then of course the mains. Uh, that's one that you bolt bolt uh, into the under the crankcase into the block. You vote that on for the block. Now what you're doing is called the high skill stuff. Well, I guess it could have been, but I, I didn't think so. Uh, the guy that wrote me in on it, uh, he had been doing it for a little while, and he... Uh, the, the tool tool and die area and uh, crankshaft that's not the assembly line where somebody no, just uh, 
No. Takes a, no, it's way head and puts it on, paid to inf in insert bearing and all that kind of stuff. No, you you just um, so uh, you quit. Then what'd you do? Uh, I didn't do anything for a couple of weeks. I would just look for a job. I wanted I wanted to get in engineering. That's what I wanted to get in an engineering outfit somewhere. That's what I actually wanted to do. Um, or I could have worked as a diesel mechanic. In fact, I hired in. I hired in Memphis, Tennessee, in a bus, in a Greyhound bus. Uh, 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 one time, one of, in between one of my discharges, I hired in there, and we went out. And the guy that hired me was an assistant, and the, the big boss came in and, and uh, he said, uh, "Ask him." I said, what do you got here? And he had, his, had my application in his hand. And he, I said, he said, I just hired this guy. And for what? He told him. He said, we don't have a, a mechanic's job open. He said, but he's going he's gonna to drive the buses in and out of the, of the garage until there's an opening. And then he's going he's gonna to take a, take a, a job. And, he said, we can't use him. He said, why well, may can't use him? He said, the Korean War just started. He said, and they don't have him in now. I said, they can't, can't have him. I said, I've been discharged three times. I got six years. <laughs> I got six years active duty. They can't call me. They can't call me if they want me. And uh, he said, they'll get you some way. And I, said, <laughs> I told him a few classic words and left. So when did you end up finding another job? No, I went back. Oh, you humbled yourself and went back. Yeah, I went back. That's when when the Korean War was going. I, that was the last last time I went in. Oh. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So then you turned around and spent <coughs> forty some years. Forty years I was at Pontiac. Doing the same thing? No, no. Oh no, I did that for a while. Then they went to the they went to the V8. That was straight eight crank with the big old long engine, you know. Then I went they, then they went to the V8, and I worked. I didn't. I think I worked over in the rod department for a little while, and then uh, I went. I did go back to to the crankshaft department though for a while, and then uh, then I moved. And they put me in a gun shop. You know, they used to build guns over there at Pontiac uh, for for uh, for the war. And they were still building them when when I was in there. Then in, in uh, what, what kind of guns? Forty-six, oh, fifty millimeter something. I forgot uh -huh. what. Yeah, I don't know what. I, they gave me a little piece of steel just for the for the breech on it. They gave me a little piece of steel, said straighten that. Then they had to grind it, and uh, and uh, but I didn't cut it. I didn't cut the thing. I just got it ready to cut, and I straightened it and grind both sides of it and all that stuff. And then they had a piece that was flat and level, smooth. They could work on it. You know, surprising. Steel is just like. Um, Caramel. You can bend steel, do all kinds of stuff with it. I, yeah. When I first saw that happen at one of the car companies, I was amazed. It's so pliable. I mean, you you heat it, you get it so hot. Yeah. Oh yeah. I watched them make piston rods. Yeah. Oh yeah. They had a piece of square steel, round. They were going over a conveyor, and they plug it into an electrical circuit and within about 10 inches that whole piece of steel is orange hot. Yeah. And then it drops down and they hit it three or four times down the shaft and it comes out a piston rod and they dump it into a pail of water to harden it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Oh yeah. And it was just maybe maybe the length of this room and you watch them, 
from here, about here it was orange, and it would go through a couple of hits and come out and dump in. Well, I used to work, I used to work uh, uh, on, on uh, with Pontiac, and I got laid off, and I hired in at GMC, and I hired in as an inspector when they used to build the buses, you know, for the, for the city buses, transportation. I, I got in on the very last run of that, and uh, then they, they uh, transferred me around first one place to the other, and then I got called back to Pontiac and went back to Pontiac, and they put me back on, put me on an inspection over there, and I stayed on the inspection the rest of the time I was there. So the fact that you didn't have a high school diploma didn't seem to be a bother, eh? I got my, I had my diploma. How did you get that? GED. Ah, so this was after you got out of the service? No, I got it when I was first time I was in. I meant to get a, I meant to get my, uh, uh, a degree somewhere, or at least get a little bit more education. So I, when I first went in the Air Force, I, I, I got, got all of the stuff I needed and finished up. And, Good um, for you. That's yeah. probably significant. I had a second. Second time I I went in, third, second time I think I went in. They, uh, yeah, it was second time. Uh, they give you a test, you know, they always test you when you go in. And they told me I could have any school that the Air Force had except cadet school. And they weren't hiring it, they weren't, they weren't taking any cadets at all. So I couldn't have gotten there that, nobody could get in. And then, then they, then they said you had to have two years college. Well, that that kept me out. I couldn't get in then. Then the Korean War started, and they told me they'd take you with a cadet, uh, take you into cadet school if you had had a diploma, uh, high school diploma. And I went in and tried to get it, and they said you're already on orders to go overseas. You can't get it, so I didn't get it then. And that's all I went in. All I ever went to the Air Force for was to fly. And I yeah, never did. You you told me earlier when when you got out of school or when you started deciding where you were going. Well, let me rephrase. You you already knew where you wanted to go, but you went to a Navy recruiter and they turned you down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did they turn you down? They said that's colorblind. And was there a correctional no. problem with your eyes too? No, it wasn't. He, was he, just colorblind. He showed me what I was looking for, and I, I, I proved it wasn't colorblind. But he found out I was 16 years old, <laughs> and he wouldn't take me. Okay, but they then referred you to the Air Force. To the Air Force. Yep. Yeah, he said. Which is why you wanted to go to in the first place. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I wanted to be a Jimmy Doolittle. And fly off, but I didn't know Jimmy would. I thought he was a Navy man, and no. I, they wouldn't know. No, he, Army Air Force. Yeah. So I, I, uh, he told me. He said, "Now, when you get down there, and he ask you, if he ask you how old you are, just tell me you're 17. Don't change your mind." And I said, well, "That's what I'll do." And I went down there. And he didn't even. I don't know whether he even asked us how. He said, "You got one in the Air Force. There's three of us." I said, "Yes." He said, sign here. Well, that Navy recruiter had already talked him into it, told him all the, all the stuff, and he just said, sign here. Where did you hear about Jimmy Doolittle? I saw the movie. The, which one? I don't remember which one. When he... There wasn't any movie about that. Yeah, it was, too. In, in the 40s? Yeah, it was. Yeah? Mm-hmm. They had a... Uh, Oh, uh, I don't know what Jimmy was flying, but he flew he flew that thing off of that aircraft carrier. The Hornet. I saw him do it. Uh, I say I saw him. I saw the movie that he did it on. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I know they had a movie, but that yeah. was later. No, this was isn't. over the ten years ago, or fifteen. It was in the forties. Yeah. That he did it. And uh, it was nineteen forty-two. And right after Pearl, Pearl was in December, January, February, March, 
somewhere right around then, mm -hmm. and that's when they went out and bombed Japan. Yeah, that's what he did. He flew off. He flew off of that aircraft carrier and went on to Japan and bombed that place. Somewhere over there. Well, the last movie I saw, there wasn't anybody in the movie that was alive back in the 40s yeah. that was in that movie. So, yeah. well, I said I'm going to go. Well, that's impressive. That's what I wanted to do. That's that's what gave me the idea of going into the in the cadet school. But I uh, I never got to go. But I'd have been a good pilot. If I'd learned how to fly. <laughs> so anyhow, I went back to that eye problem because that was part of, I thought was part of the reason you never got into flight school. No, uh, no, that wasn't it. Uh, uh, he said that. What he had was a piece of cardboard about that big as that area right there. He said, what do you see in that? I said, I don't see anything. Colors. And uh, he said, don't you see that number in there? I said, number? And he said, yeah, there's a number in there. When he told me that, when I saw it. And, and I said, and he said, oh, since you can't get they won't take you colorblind. I said, I'm not colorblind. I said, I just showed you that. And he showed me something else, and I could tell him what was on yeah. all the rest of them. Uh, That's went. funny. Both of you went into flight. Yeah. Can, can I make one quick comment? Just as, one. As a kid, 10 years younger than him, he was an inspiration to me when he came home. All the things he'd done, I mean, they were totally different than the farming cotton. And I was, I was so pleased with what I saw him do and the places he'd been until I knew that I had to do something else. And it's, it's all because of him. Well, that's pretty neat. One other question. You were involved most of your Air Force life in Panama. Well, other than flipping around the states back and forth, your duty was in Panama. Yeah, I spent and more then time. The short five or six months, who knows why, you spent in Okinawa. That that wasn't very far from the war going on in China. I know it. It was off coast. And Korea. Yeah. And none of that ever popped up, or because that other X or check mark is. Okinawa is just south of the Japanese islands yeah, and just east off the coast. Yeah, it is. And that was a Japanese possession, which it still is. Mm -hmm. well, what was the weather like there? <clears throat> uh, I'd say it's about, about like this. I don't think it got quite, I don't know, I, I wasn't there in the winter time. I was, I was there in the summer, and uh, it was, it would be warm like this, it'd be yeah. kind of hot. Yeah. They said the people that live there live, there are more people living to be over a hundred than anywhere else. That make you want to go back and... It makes me wish I'd stayed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> I, I just uh, we were just laughing at the thought of the guy who went to the Air Force to fly and wound up on boats. What now? You, you went into the Air Force to fly and you wound up on boats. Yes, yeah, I did. That was that was my uh, that was my duty for from uh, 1949 until 1952. That was my duty was on boats. It was it's a good duty. It was a good a good job to do, uh, and and it, it wasn't it wasn't hard. And all the guys, it's kind of we were kind of like brothers in that outfit. And if uh, you wanted something, needed something, you usually got it. I remember one time I went to <laughs> I went up to Connecticut. Uh, when it's one of the boys was on my boat, he came in and he said, hey, hey Tom said, uh, let's go to my house. And I said, well, Ken, we got duty today. 
he said, I already talked to Pappy, and he said, he said it's okay. And that was our commander, you know, our leader. And, uh, and I didn't even talk to, I didn't even talk to him. I just jumped in the car and we took off. <laughs> and, and, and we worked one day on, two off. Well, we, we, that gave us three days because he gave us, he gave us a duty day. Well, then the next duty day, we decided we'd just stay and not, not go back. And so we stayed another, so they gave me another three days. So that's six days right there that I'm not even there. I got back and old Pappy Sykes was, he was a big old boy. He picked me up and he shook me and he called me all kind of names. And he said, I ought to kill you. <laughs> he said, <laughs> but, uh, he said, get that hose and hose this deck down. I never had to do that kind of stuff. I never, I never had to wash anything. Uh, just my teeth. Did he know that someone had said you had gotten permission to do it? Huh? Did he know that? Pappy? Yeah. Yeah, he says, he, yeah, he knew. He knew it. And Memphis had told me that. that he said why it, he didn't kill you. Yeah, it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. But he was pretty good, though. He used to, he, he was a married man, but he used to run around with us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was, he was, he lived in D.C., he and his wife did. You were quite a rascal, you know. Well, I guess I was. <laughs> <laughs> I usually, I usually got along pretty good with most people. I'm, I'm also taken back by something you told me. Most of the officers I've written about were fine, respectable men. And I can say the same about my Army Captain Jones. That's quite a nice tribute to say of all your officers, particularly the one, the one well, that was the aggravator. Mm -hmm. Jones was okay. I don't know. I don't know why. Like I told you, I don't know why <clears throat> he wanted to give me a general court martial. Uh, I only guessed at it. I guessed at it, like I told you. I guessed at that, and I think that was probably it. I don't. I can't remember any other thing that would have caused him to. And you never told him that you had given him a good recommendation, eh? No. No, I never did. We never, we never got into that discussion. If I had, I would have, I would have told him. I suppose. Well, at that time, you didn't even know what the reason was. No, I didn't know. Uh -oh. What was his What was his first name? Uh, do you remember? No, I don't remember. No. no. Captain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just wondered if if you knew what his no, entire name was. Know. I can't remember it. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate well you coming down. It's too bad you couldn't have been here for Jim's. We had a good time when he came in and talked about his. Yeah, I'd like to hurt him. You got, you got some stuff you're going to give him for it? <laughs> he's he's he already got it. it. Well, he ain't told me about it. He's he really in trouble. Yeah. Uh, kid brothers are supposed to be doing that. <laughs> he told us about his... Purple Hearts and Medal of Honor and all that stuff. <laughs> Did you hear about those? No, I didn't. You didn't? didn't. He didn't tell me about anything. You got to be careful when you're talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, it's it's quite different. Just being out in there and out here. But I wouldn't mind. <clears throat> I, wish, I wish now I had stayed in active duty even when I was discharged. I know a boy that, uh, that was in the Air Force and he, he stayed in and never, he told me, he said, I make more money. I make more money in retirement from the Air Force than I make from, than I made from uh, my job at Pontiac. I don't know what he, what he
he hired the idiot, but he said he did. You, you think that's true in your case? No, it wouldn't have been true in my case. <laughs> uh, that, you think you would have made more money in the staying in? No. If I had stayed, yeah, I would have made, I would have made, uh, I could have got a military retirement. No, if I stayed in. Mr. McKay, thanks for the interview. Good interview. Uh, uh, thanks yeah, for the thank interview. Oh, well, we better get going. Yeah, it's very you. You, oh, you know wow. what? I'm, I'm really glad. Taking the time to come up and come down. Yeah, I enjoyed it.